You know, you spend seven months a year writing a book, well I do anyway, and that means getting up at 4.30 in the morning and um, exercising for an hour and then taking the dog out, because that's all you're going to get outside. And I walk along the river for an hour and then I, uh, I've made my breakfast before I leave and then I eat it when I come back. And by 6, 6.15 I'm writing and I don't get up from my desk until 6.15 that night. And then that's your day and then you're exhausted because you've been living in a, in a world in your head, you haven't seen anybody. You, my, my darling partner puts a cup of tea there nine times out of ten. There are three at the end of the day and I haven't even touched them. I've been looking after myself since I was 12 years old. I remember in the orphanage at about five or six years old, I had an English name and that was enough. You know, I was an Englishman and therefore I had to be beaten up regularly. I was also the smallest kid in the school. And one of these big, beefy, giant guys that would come up and say, I'm going to beat you up, of Axel Yodon. And I used to say, look, don't hit me, please don't hit me. If you don't hit me, I'll tell you a story. And they'd all gather around and I'd invent a story and I'd, I'd never actually tell them the end. And I'd say, Any, anybody hits me in the orphanage before tomorrow morning, you don't have to hear the end of the story. And so I have been, in a sense, telling stories since, since I was six years old. When eventually at the age of 55, I decided that it was time I wrote my first novel. The original plan was that I would write the first novel at 35. But my son Damon was born a haemophiliac and he required quite a lot of money to keep, keep him fit. And I would never have earned that as a writer. So I waited until he died at the age of 27. And so I was then 55, so I postponed, if you like, my storytelling career. You don't sit down there and say, I'm gonna write a world bestseller and, and, and suddenly I'm gonna be rich and you don't need any of that shit. You know? When I sat down to write Power of One, I thought, well, what do I write? And they go, oh, I just write about myself. So I wrote The Power of One. I gave myself exactly a year for each book and I had to write 6,000 words a day. So I suddenly heard the grandfather clock strike midnight. I hadn't finished the book and that was a year. And I was terribly upset because I gave myself exactly a year, stupidly as it may be. I mean, it's only a practice book anyway. Um, I started to cry. I was just a very tired, mate. And, and my wife woke up and she came and she said, I've been married to you for 32 years. I've never seen you cry. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm finished my book. And she said, don't be an idiot. She said, I can remember when you jumped up at three o'clock in the morning and you threw the book you were reading and threw it against the bed and you said, this is a heap of shit, I'm going to write my own. You've got till 3.17. So I went, Brrr. I finished at 17 minutes past 3.17, just on 3.30, and I'd met my first deadline. I wrapped it up and used it as a doorstop. The garden for me is exactly the opposite to what I'm doing. The one is sitting down there going tap, 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 tap. The other is getting involved, getting your hands dirty, watching things grow. And the miracle of seeing things grow. When you take a tiny, tiny seed and suddenly eight months later, you're eating beetroot, you're eating beans, you're eating cabbage, you're eating whatever. You think, oh, this is a goddamn miracle. The, the strength of the taste. It hasn't been seeped out, it hasn't been kept in a cold room and it's just sharp and clean and beautiful. There's so much that, that nature gives so generously and the sense of satisfaction, but the joy of it is anybody can do it. Publicity for me is simply to tell people, yes, I have another book out, and if they're interested, it's available. A winning bloom. As beautiful as that, Camellia. Don't make a 
make up the makeup. <laughs> Michael, go for it. You may kiss me, but don't. Don't look up the makeup. <laughs> I find writers who think that that's beneath their dignity to go out there onto the hustings and sell their book and talk about it. That's bullshit. I mean, they're the guys who benefit. They're the guys who get the money. They're the guys who use it for educating their kids and buying houses and having nice gardens, etc. So you ought to help. You know, there's nothing worse than somebody coming up to you in a cocktail party and saying, uh, and what's your next book about? And you've just written 693 pages. It's taken you seven months. And you've got approximately, you might be able to hold her or his interest for the next 15 seconds. And you're supposed to deliver a verdict about what your next book is about. So I'll try and do that. Um, my next book is about a young bloke. He's Australian, but he's a black Irishman. He, he's big and beautiful, blue-eyed, dark hair, and a great sport, and he can do anything. And even at the age of 16 or 17, women of 25 and 30 are lusting after this guy. The war comes, and he is sent to Singapore, which is captured by the Japanese. And he is then trying to save a mate, is beaten up severely by some Japanese soldiers and officer who smash his face to pulp so that it will never recover. But before he left, there was a young girl and she waits for him. And he calls her and he says, don't come and see me. You won't want to have anything to do with me. And she says, mate, I was standing at the gangplank and I saw you coming down. And I love you. And I always will. And we then see the story of how a strong woman pulls together a family and a suburb. He becomes a lawyer. He fights for the underdog. He fights for his own kind. He knows what it is to be beaten. And so we start to get the story of an intimate suburb, of a people, of change, of the law, cruelty, politics. Danny Dunn is one of those stories that's got everything. People ask me why I haven't written, if you like, a, a, an autobiography and, uh, and I quote Morris West, who used to be a friend of mine, and when I asked him the same question, and Morris said, there's just one problem. And I said, what's that, mate? He said, I don't much care for the central character. And I, that's about how I feel too. You have to do it, you, you do it with all the will you possibly can, but I'd much rather be going tap, 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 or digging in the garden, or taking Mr. Snore here for a walk, and then standing in front of the camera talking. I, I should point out that I've written books looking through a window at a brick wall where the pigeons popped. You know, because, you know, a book is an inside thing and you don't need to have this grand, wonderful view or you don't need to see the beach, you don't need to have any of those things because it's all happening internally. A writer's life is a lonely one. You, you, you learn to spend a lot of time with yourself and whatever's happening, it's lovely known as your head. 